Wednesday morning here on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, as always, and I am your host. And today we are talking progressive. What does it mean? Where is it going? And is there trouble brewing in Mouseland? Now, for those who are wondering, what the hell is Mouseland, Chris? Um, Tommy Douglas's famous speech of white cats and uh, black cats and needing to elect mice and because that's who the people need to be represented by were the mice. And we are talking about um, some issues that the NDP are stumbling over federally right now. And to do that, to have this conversation, which I'm so happy to always have a conversation like this, uh, we have the former NDP candidate for Lakeland here in the province of Alberta, Des Bissano. Des, thank you so much for doing this. I am I'm actually really excited to get into this conversation today. Awesome. I'm really excited too, too. And uh, thanks so much for having me. I was really excited. I just kind of threw a tweet out being like, somebody let me rant on their podcast. And I was really excited. Yeah, you responded. I, 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 again, as I said in the pre-interview, I love when people rant because it makes my job a lot easier and I can sit back <laughs> and just maybe make a sandwich, go grab a drink. But uh, but I won't because that's who that as the host, I need to be engaged. Um, yeah. So Des, I, I want to start with this because I think people would want to know this right off the bat. Why, how did you get involved in the NDP? Yeah. Okay. So it's, um, it's kind of complicated. I've like always been pretty aware of politics. Um, and like politics was something that was rel- like relatively spoken about in my family. And so we all knew about politics. Um, my parents are big green supporters because they smoke the ganja and they really wanted it legalized. So they were lifelong green supporters. And like, I thought I was going to be a green supporter when I was younger. And uh, when I got into grade 11, my history teacher showed us a documentary of Jack Layton. And I was like, oh, wow, he's really cool. Maybe, maybe I'll vote NDP. Um, and then after he passed away and they had their leadership um, race, I saw Nikki Ashton on stage doing that power walk. Oh, that was the moment I was like, yep, I'm orange. That's it. And then she didn't win. And I was like, I guess I'll, I guess I will vote for Tom Mulclair through gritted teeth. Um, but with my most recent involvement was uh, in December of last year, I got contacted about starting up the EDA here in Lakeland. Um, and I had been really, really attentive to the 2019 election. Um, at the time I was working two jobs. I was at a cannabis store and I was working housekeeping. And I would literally go into like the rooms at the hotel, turn the TV on to watch Jug Me talk and clean toilets. And I would be like elbow deep in the pipes, like really getting in there and listening to Jug Me talk about the things that I was like worried about. Cause you know, I was, I was working two jobs here in Alberta where you get 15 bucks an hour now. Yeah. Still couldn't pay any of my bills, couldn't do anything. Um, so thinking back to that, when I got contacted by the party, I was like, yeah, yeah, of course I'm going to run or not run, but like, you know, join up. Um, and then they asked me later on to run after we had lost somebody who was going to be candidate. And I kind of hummed and hawed over it. And then I was like, yeah, all right, whatever. I haven't done anything cool lately. You know, we've been stuck inside, might as well. Um, Good but, reason you know, to run, I guess. <laughs> Well, you know, there was also, I, I'm very dedicated to, um, to social justice and, and to making change in my community. And so I saw that as an opportunity. Um, and also like, we have an Albertan conservative sitting in that seat. They don't do any work. <laughs> like Shannon Stubbs isn't doing anything. No offense to you, Shannon, if you listen to this, but you don't do anything. I call your office all the time. You never answer. Um, you know, but like, I saw that opportunity and I just wanted to, to go for it. And um, reconciliation is really important to me. And I thought that the NDP had that same value. So you, you put your name forward in the 2021 uh, federal election, which literally just happened in August, <laughs> September and October. So this is relative, well, August and September. So this is relatively fresh. Yeah, um, I still before, have the hangover from it. Exactly. Before we talk about the the shift in thinking that you've gone through in the last literally two months I want to talk about that campaign for you because you you heard what Jagmeet said uh, said on the tv when you were elbow deep in toilets as you as so eloquently put it which your words not mine um (laughs) but being a candidate is another thing you get to see the internal workings of a party um did the 
disillusioned did the illusion of what you thought the NDP were come crumbling down during that election a little bit when you started to see how the internal party worked because being a president and being the candidate two different things in my opinion yeah yeah that's such a good question um there were some disappointments in the election um mostly just in just being a rural candidate and being in a rural riding where like our 2019 result was six percent in lakeland right like that's not a lot um they just didn't really put the effort that other ridings got and that really affected me because you know i didn't get leaflets right away i didn't get signs right away i was actually really fortunate that um uh one of Heather McPherson's team, Erica, is like a superhero. And she she's the reason I got as many votes as I did because she's the person who gave me pretty much everything that I had to go and do door to door and have signs. Um, so, you know, there wasn't really a lot of that um, attention to my riding. And I also noted that, like, I talked to other candidates from rural ridings. Um, I won't mention their names um, just for their own privacy if they want to talk about it. They're, I, I mean, they, I'm sure they will. Um, but, you know, other people had that same problem when they were in rural ridings. And so that was something that I was disappointed in. Um, I think that the magic stayed a little bit longer because I did meet Jagmeet in person. And like, that was kind of one of those really exciting things. And like, like that, I think kept me going a little bit longer. Cause I was like, oh yeah, like actually he's a real, he's like a really cool person, IRL. Like when you meet him, he's, he's very nice. He's shorter than I expected. Um, which I, I was like, oh my gosh, like we're almost the same height. I thought you were going to be like eight feet tall and incredibly intimidating. I'm just going to um, interrupt but, you know, because I, I met him in real life too. And when you see him on TV, you expect this big, massive, bushy yeah. beard. And when you see it in real life, you're like, what, wait, what, what is, does the yeah, camera like add so like little. 10 inches to your beard? Like, what is, what am I looking at right now? This is not yeah. the exactly thing that I know. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's like such a, he's like so nice. And he's got such a sunny like disposition in person, you just can't help but like be excited and feel excited what what he's doing. Um, and I think that that kept me going a little bit longer. And like, a lot of the supports being candidates, I th think kept me being really excited about the party. And honestly, that's most of like, that's really where most of my, my love for the NDP came from this election was the volunteers that I was meeting the people I was connecting with. Um, some of the other like first time grassroots candidates who had the same values that I have and like really wanted to push the party in, in ways that I feel like the party hasn't been pushed in a long time. Like those people are what what made me love everything about the NDP this election. And the, the party itself had its moments, but but overall, I think it was the people that kept me around. Now, for those who are listening to this across this great country of ours, because uh um, well, some might say it's uh, a little bit of an issue right now, but uh, who's listening to this across this country? Um, Lakeland is in the center. Just I'm trying to do my ge geography here with a very foggy mind. Center east uh, of the province of Alberta. It encompasses uh, from. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Because yeah. we're we're a little bit northern, like we get a little north. That's true. I'd because say. you go to you go to Cold Lake or no? You're... Um, so it goes. It's Lloydminster's Alberta side up to Bonneville, and then Bonneville. all the way up to Athabasca, yep. <laughs> and then down to um, it, it cuts off like right where Elk Island is, and okay. then just along that northern part of the highway. I don't think it touches any of the southern places. So you do Mundare, Vegreville, all those yeah. fun places. Okay. <laughs> For those who know me, who have listened to the show, know that I was a reporter in Lloydminster, so I know these areas quite well. And before this interview, she was talking about her work, and I was like, I know that place. I love that place. <laughs> I used to cover that place. Um, so it is it is rural. It is on the east side of Edmonton, if you were looking at a map, east side of Edmonton. Um, so it is a heavy oil capital of Alberta, if I'm not mistaken, Lloydminster is. Yeah. It is a very entrenched conservative er, uh, area of the province. Even during the 2015 uh, sweep of the NDP provincially, it was one of the ridings that did stay in the progressive conservative camp. Speaking of that, we, 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 not speaking of that, but I just want to give my listeners some knowledge there, but September 20th, you don't win. 
<laughs> you are now sort of in the, as I've heard from a lot of candidates from all parties, you are dropped like a $2 bill. Like it is, you are no longer important to the party. The people who are important are the people who are important. You stayed active, though, because I went through your Twitter history and your social media history, and you stayed active because you, it seemed like you had a passion for what you were doing. Most people would have just gone away and just stepped back for a bit, but you did stay uh, active. Why was that important to you? Before we get into the big thing, why was that important for you to stay active? Um, <clears throat> I started something, and I, like, man, I'm running and going door to door was incredible. And like talking to people and getting to hear some of the things that people all across um, Lakeland were dealing with. Like my, my brother and I, my brother was like my life saver through this. He came door knocking with me so much and he's he's got a disability. So like I really tortured him making him walk, but he came with me and he was so happy the whole time taking notes. Um, but he, he and I had a conversation with a woman in St. Paul for, I'm gonna get emotional about it. Um, probably an hour about like rural suicide and the, the problems that you know people are experiencing not having access to mental health care and like um, my spouse and I knocked on every single door in Ranfurly and we found out that they were supposed to get um, sewage and water lines 30 years ago and it just never came they never got it so they don't have potable water and they don't have sewage there which is ridiculous of the whole community, but it's so small and there's, there's no like um, local economy because you know, everything's kind of decrepit downtown where there would have been stores. And I assume there were stores there, but it's all just kind of buildings. Um, and like a lot of the people that I talked to asked me if I was going to keep doing it because people were hopeful having a young person. Um, people were hopeful having somebody who was passionate and somebody who who was listening. And that's that's what I really focused on was listening to people. And I wanted to keep doing that. You, you have taken issue with uh, a big thing that has happened in Canada over the last, I would say two, three weeks as of uh, mm -hmm. recording this and as of airing about a month ago. Um, I, I wanna I wanna ask this question to begin with because we're gonna get into the meat and potatoes now. Mm -hmm. When did the when did the the NDP mirror break? Because you you look in a mirror, the party mirror, and you say, "I can see myself in this party." When did the mirror break for you? When did that break and say, "I, I can't see myself in this party anymore because of X, Y, and Z"? Um, at the crack started on Friday, and it got bigger over Saturday, Sunday. Uh, I was on the. <clears throat> Alberta and NDP council meetings on the Saturday and Sunday that like what's written really started to get escalated. Um, that's when we, we, you know, we had the emergency resolution getting the, the Alberta NDP to express solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en. And um, like those meetings were so exhausting just being there. I was, so, I just was tired. I was like, man, I don't want to be here. You know, I was, I was wearing my pajamas. I showed up late the second day. And like the only thing that I did that whole meeting was go on. I was in my house coat with my hair tied up because I just got out of the shower to go yell and condemn the BC NDP. Cause it's like, this is just, this is all I can muster out of myself because I'm just tired. Um, and then Monday when Jagmeet Singh still hadn't made any, anything and he had tweeted about something else and just there was no acknowledgement whatsoever of what had happened over the weekend and what was still happening to land defenders and and just like like that's when that's when it was like I, okay I, what like are you serious um and then it was just all i was just mad <laughs> after that i'm like all right fuck this, this is bullshit <laughs> And I appreciate your honesty and your candor here because I think we we need to have these types of conversations because you are not the only person who I've seen on social media who's been pissed off at the NDP for the federal NDP for not yeah. stepping up and saying anything. Now, 
I, I try to do a little bit of research before any interview and I've gone back through Jagmeet's uh, social media and I can't find anything. He might have said something, but I just, I wasn't doing a hard dive and I was looking for something to say, okay, he did say something or he didn't say something or X, Y, and Z. But the devil advocate in me is going to say this to you and I want to know where you're going to come after this. Mm-hmm. He represents an NDP uh, riding in the province mm-hmm. of BC. He is good friends with Premier John Horgan, the British Columbia Premier, and they seem to be BFFs. And every time Jug meets in BC, it looks like they're going out to dinner. Um, he has to keep his friends close because he doesn't have a lot of friends in this, this country mm-hmm. right now. Is it unreasonable for him not to say anything and just let the premier do what he needs to do or should he have come out like the day it happened and said something yeah um yeah, this is a really interesting question because there is a lot of layers about it um and i like i've spoken to a friend of mine in the ndp as well about this and you know just expressed how i was feeling about these things and um i did get a lot of like context that i felt like i was missing and and i was really grateful they were able to answer questions for me um but like even still as far as like i can see it as you know as like an indigenous person the way that i see it is if you are going to dedicate any amount of your time talking about reconciliation and talking about caring about indigenous people and caring about the climate caring about the planet if you don't act on it when it matters is it true you know if if a friend of mine was going around doing a bunch of crap, like like, any kind of crap that I didn't approve of or that that I knew was wrong. I'd be like, dude, what are you doing? You know, you you still have to be able to show that accountability. And I think that the NDP made a fatal mistake in not acknowledging that this is a problem and not acknowledging it on on Friday, because at least to, to myself, what it gave, gave me the, the impression that it gave me was that, you know, we're going to we're going to say everything we can, all these nice things to Indigenous people to get your vote. We're going to say we're, we're all about reconciliation. You know, we're, we're going to talk about all of these things when Mr. Trudeau doesn't do this. Mr. Trudeau won't do that for Indigenous people. But when it's Mr. Horgan. Can we can we as a government, you know, if, if the NDP were to form a government and this were to happen and they were the government, could we trust them to be accountable? not only to indigenous peoples, but to everything that they've said. Because if you can't hold people within your own circle accountable, can you be held accountable? I don't think so. And, and that's why I'm frustrated because I think that that it's missing, that accountability is missing. And that, that recognition that that accountability was needed, I, like, I think it was a mistake. I, I remember the last election because we covered it quite extensively here on the show. Um, we we I remember reading the platform and it was there was a lot of things about reconciliation, about First Nations and Indigenous issues. Uh, and uh, after the election, the NDP under Jagmeet Singh had a great opportunity to advance that because uh, we saw on September 30th, Justin Trudeau fly off to B.C., go on vacation on Truth and Reconciliation Day. Um, I, and this is just my perspective. I'm not putting words in Des's Dez, mouth here. So please, if you're going to send negative comments, please send them with crossborder photography at gmail.com and I'll file, the, file them in the appropriate location. Um, the NDP, like you said, have dropped the ball, have, mm-hmm. have stepped over themselves and they have done a face plant into anything, like into wet cement, it seems like. Charlie Angus was very vocal after Justin Trudeau went on uh, vacation on Truth and Reconciliation. Jagmeet Singh was very uh, vocal. And now it seems like we don't hear a blip out of them. And as a former NDP candidate yourself, you must not just be pissed off at the leader, but everyone in the party like like i don't yeah. even know like has heather mcpherson said anything has blake uh uh the new N- ndp M- mp for uh, edmonton griesbach said anything like it just seems like it's very like 
I, I'm angry for you. And I, I like, yeah. I, we, we've literally known each other for 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, like, so here's the, the candidates have, or sorry, candidates, I guess they're no longer candidates. They have their seats. Oh, just me who lost. <laughs> um, you know, the, the MPs, I understand. And I've talked, um, like I said, like, you know, I, I come with some context. I understand what it, what it's like, um, being in that situation, kind of hearing from them and, and seeing their statements and, like I, I have a little bit of privy information. It's not a whole lot, and it's really like not that privy. But I like to pretend that I'm like an insider, you know. You're in the know. Um, <laughs> I'm in the know. Yeah, you know, like I'm just like really important in the government. It's fine. Um, but uh, sorry. Yeah, like they they have said some things. Like Leah Gazan and um, like Matt Green has come out and like tagged John Horgan. But it took like so many people. To sit, like on Twitter, harassing, making them say things, calling into the offices of MPs. It took so long. And like, it sucks because they're in a hard spot because no matter what they do, it's not going to be enough. Um, even, even if they had done something on Friday or put out the statements on Friday, like they don't, their, their hands are tied in a lot of ways. And I get that. But at the very least, like, just acknowledging that, man, we should have said something sooner to, to start, you know, um, acknowledging that there's a little bit of that gaping hole and listening to people about why they're frustrated. And yeah, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a tricky situation when it comes to like, what people I feel like think they're allowed to say, but like, at the same time, it's 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 just do the right thing you know just do the right thing I, I, hindsight's 50 50 it's always 50 50 yeah. you know you're, you're always gonna fuck up some way and you're always gonna yeah. try, you're always gonna try and better yourself another way so i'm gonna ask this what does it take to rectify this situation it has been almost a week and a half two weeks since rcmp officers went into the Wetsu, uh, I'm going to pronounce the name here incorrectly, I do. Wetsu. There you go, uh, land, and forcibly removed and arrested hereditary chiefs, uh, protesters, uh, people who believe that uh, they have the right to the land. And I, 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 I'm not a legal expert, so that's why I say believe yeah. because I don't know. Yet again, this is just Chris Brown. Yet again, if you want to send me negative comments about how I'm addressing this right now, please send them across border photography at gmail.com and I'll follow them in the appropriate location. And they arrested journalists. Yeah. Like this is a big deal. Yeah. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to save Jugmeet Singh a little bit here. Not a lot, but a little bit. Aaron O'Toole hasn't said shit about this. Justin Trudeau hasn't really said much about this, if anything, even though he should be the first one out on the big microphone saying something. Oh, he's still doing it, right? And the last one is Elizabeth May. Yeah. Because this, is, this was happening all during the time of COP26. They were all over in Glasgow and they were all uh, shaking hands with Boris Johnson it seems, and yet again, this could be just me, and I want to I want to ask this appropriate question. Indigenous issues are cool during elections. The moment an election happens, uh, finishes though, who? What are we talking yeah, about? Hundred percent. Okay. Hundred percent. And you know why? You know what? I think one of the reasons for that is because whether or not any of us want to admit it or acknowledge it, um, even progressives, we're operating in a colonial system and the colonial system is always going to make colonialism win so it doesn't matter it doesn't it doesn't really matter how many times you're going to say reconciliation matters to me reconciliation matters to me because it proves time and time again that in this party system in this colonial system that we are entrenched in colonialism is just going to keep winning and i'm frustrated because I believed, like I really believed. Sorry. I really believed it wasn't just a lie, you know? <laughs> and then it was. And it's shitty. It's shitty that it is. It's like this. But like, what do I expect? What do we expect? <laughs> 
are you alone in this thinking? Are there other? No, I people, don't think so. Are there other people you've talked to that you've? Uh, again, I've seen your social media posts and people share them, they like them, they retweet them. And I know some yeah. candidates here in the city of Calgary and around the southern part of the city um, have privately reached out and said, you need to have her on the show because we are feeling that way as well. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I ask this question sincerely and I mean it with no malice. Canadians have dropped the ball. And we saw at the beginning of this year, the discovery of First Nation children, Indigenous children in unmarked graves at former residential schools. There was a stat that came out today, I think it was today or yesterday, over 7,000 children have been found. I remember the uproar that after the first 200 were found and now it's just a stat as an indigenous yeah. person how does this make you feel about canada that we have just we 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 we, we say the right things when we need to but we fuck you over when we when you're not when no one's paying attention anymore yeah yeah you know it's hard for me too because I I walk through my life with a really high level of privilege because I I can just blend in you know my my dad is quite white unlike my mom and my brother like unless I tell you I'm Métis you don't know right away you know some people have called me out on it before they say I have the high cheekbones and I always feel really excited about that I'm like oh my god got something from the ancestors <laughs> um but like yeah like you said like it's just it's every time it's just the ball gets dropped and like um recently you know speaking about the the children the residential schools um I can't remember who was saying it but somebody was talking about that incident again and said 215 without even acknowledging that there had been more you know just 215 is just the number that people are going to refer to because it's a comfortable number yeah it's high but it's not as high as 7,000 right it's not as high as 10,000 or 60,000 or however many other people were stolen because we don't know. We don't know how many. And, you know, we're never going to find out the truth because there's a vested interest in hiding that. Um, and I think, I think the thing that sucks is that, like, this happens over and over again because it's designed to. And it's designed to hurt settlers too, you know? Um, people talk about land back a lot and I'm, I'm a huge advocate for land back. I, I believe that land back honestly is how we, we remedy this crappy colonial system that we have. It's how we remedy climate change. You know, indigenous people, we protect biodiversity. We, we protect the, the planet. And I think that land back for settlers is, is something that is liberating too. You know, the Crown owns 89% of the land here in Canada, you know? Um, everything that we, we do is owned by somebody else making money off of us. And I, I think that honestly, I think Canadians need to have a conversation, settlers, you know? Am I comfortable with the way that things are when I know that things could be better for everybody? And Am I comfortable confronting the things that are uncomfortable about colonization in the way that it's benefited me? If it means I have to change my, my life somehow, because I, I don't think that we're ever going to get to the point that we need to be where we can acknowledge these hard conversations unless people do that reflection first in their own selves. Journalism is in crisis, and our mission here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast is to tell the story that isn't being told. It is vital that independent journalism survives with the rise of fake news. Every penny that is contributed to the Cross Border Interview Podcast goes to help continue our work to tell people's stories. All of our content is produced and edited by our team. The Cross Border Interview Podcast provides entirely free content, and we will never 
hide stories behind paywalls. By supporting a new model of journalism, our listeners, like you, are supporting real, independent journalism. Consider making a monthly donation via our Patreon account, or make a one-time donation by Interact eTransfer. Now, let's get back to the show. We... I have had a conversation with a former Green Party of Canada leadership contender back in their season one. Um, and I asked this question and I want to know from you though, what, wh- how, how, do we, how do we move forward? Um, First Nations are not all unified around one issue. Métis, mm-hmm. First Nation, Indigenous people are not mm-hmm. unified. Uh, there were- and We never will be. Exactly. There were some Indigenous communities that and people on Twitter who came out and said, yes, they need to remove the protesters and we need to get this pipeline built because we've invested money into this. Mm-hmm. And, and this this is gonna this is gonna be my white, my white showing here. And this is and I apologize for this question. Yeah. How 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 can how can a colonial a settler like myself who did not was not born on this land, who was not raised in this land, um, how can we help indigenous voices when there are so many indigenous voices out there that we don't know which one to potentially help uh, alleviate? or help yeah. uh, uh, boost up because I would, l- I-, I love having conversations like this because I, I, I learn because that's what I want to do, but I also get to educate people who are listening. So how do we do this? How do we move yeah. forward when we don't, there are 15 different opinions on what we should be doing with that land right now and moving forward with this pipeline that's going through there or potentially not pipeline going through there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's tricky. And like, I don't think there is a a 100% right way to do it. I think that there's, there's always going to be some trip ups, but the biggest thing is just listening to communities, understanding the context, like, like talking about um, this pipeline going through, you know, we can't really call it free prior and and informed consent, like how the UN declaration of like rights for indigenous peoples calls for, because there is wealth inequity amongst indigenous people all across Turtle Island um, here in, in Canada, right? You know, there's already that economic, um, you know, like, I'm trying to figure out, I can't have to think of the word, but you know, there, there's already that, that economic difference there and that where they would be more easily convinced into taking something like a pipeline instead of being, you know, it's easier to take advantage of those of people who are in a situation where they're um, not economically sound or don't have a financial security. And that, that's a huge problem um, with many indi- Indigenous people. And that's by design. Um, with this specific, like, Wet'suwet'en conflict, the band that wants the pipeline through is a band that was elected through the Indian Act. So that's another thing that that adds that layer is that the Indian Act is still in use today and that the Indian Act is still that colonial institution that's being used to push these things through and to create um, really a, a like, I guess like a false version of consent because, you know, it, it's, it's a consent, but it's formed through colonial creation. So it, it is complicated and it's, it's really hard to figure out exactly how to to navigate through it. But I think the best thing to do is to just spend more time listening than you do boosting or talking. And when you've heard enough indigenous perspectives and you've you've taken the time to listen, you know when you should speak up and, and what to speak up on. And most of the time, honestly, indigenous people will tell you yeah i i have learned that through all these interviews that i've done if someone has a problem with you they will speak up as much as i <laughs> as much as i don't like people speaking up on social media because i think social media has become just a crux of oh, negativity terrible. negativity sometimes yeah i have to do it yet again um, for those people who are like well you put out your show on the sh- social media well how else yeah. am i supposed to do it back me yeah. and I'll, I'll be able to do it a little bit easier um, i don't even know why i'm still on it i can't yeah. <laughs> too much we we are moving into 2022. This issue is not going anywhere because um, people like yourself, people on social media have 
caused a stir. You want you want this issue to you want the people to have their land and they have the rights to what their lands are uh, okay. used for. Um, in this province of Alberta, we have a law that literally says <laughs> you have the right to defend your property. You have the right to defend your land. But yet, mm -hmm. when it comes to the 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 good of Jason Kenney, it seems like that doesn't take effect, and we would rather forcibly remove people from this uh, their land to, to reap the benefits of the greater good in court in his yeah. words probably why is there a double standard do you believe with indigenous land issues is it politicians looking at it as a win-win situation for economic uh it increases to the economic uh prosperity of our country or is it something that i'm not looking at from from someone of your perspective why is there a disparity between in 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 this world that we still live in with laws that are still on the books of the indian act why is there still a disparity of people saying well we don't care about this law now, but in two weeks we will when it, when it doesn't benefit us. That is such a great question. Um, there's a couple of reasons that immediately come to mind. Um, one of them is that, first of all, Alberta was literally colonized by racists. Um, if you look at the history of Alberta, one of the, the main factors of like driving people to come out here, settlers to come colonize, was they wanted the Northwest to mostly be white Christians, farmers, and to keep them as racist as possible so that the indigenous people would be forced out of their homes. Um, and uh, Canada Proud was a party back in the 1800s that really orchestrated that. And they, they were very quite racist. Um, the Métis had a lot of problems with them. Um, I was reading the history of it. And as soon as I read that they they purposely colonized Alberta with racists, I was like, oh, nice. So that makes a lot of sense. Well, um, just on so, that note, for anyone who wants to do some research off the off uh, out after this interview, I highly recommend looking up the uh, looking up the Frog Lake Massacre. Um, if you want to talk about uh, settlers coming in and trying to take land, look up the Frog Lake Massacre. I, uh, that that is my I, when I was in Lloydminster, I learned a lot about that because we went out. We actually did a tour of the area that it happened and just it gives you a perspective of what we've done and how we need to rectify some situations still. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, that that's one part is that Alberta already, and just really the prairies in general already has this history um, of purposely racist settler, like settling. Um, I think that Canada as a whole has yet to really actually acknowledge everything. There, there's that truth that's missing because that truth is missing. A lot of people, um, who aren't entrenched in these ideas, who don't know Indigenous people, who aren't actively seeking to change their perspectives and who feel comfortable in their little status quo, neoliberal conservative bubbles. They're not, they're not unlearning these things that have been long seated for the last, since contact, really. Um, but especially in the last 150 years of Canada's, um, you know, confederation. And as it's been, fully you know changing over years nothing has changed in the way that people uh, at least settlers think of indigenous people um another reason i think is because settlers don't know indigenous ways of being and what i mean by that is that the earth the land plants and animals we shouldn't look at them as if they're commodities you know, they're, they're persons, they're beings. And when you look at the earth as a being, and you look at a mountain as a being, or trees as a being, or water as a being, and you acknowledge the life that's in there, you aren't as excited to take advantage of it. Because, you know, you, when you love something, when you love something that has life, you want to nourish it, you want to care for it. And when you take from it, you want to give back as much as you take or more, because that, that's the part of the reciprocity. And so I think that this missing relationship between like people like Jason Kenney, who 
probably doesn't actually know the real value of a dollar because he's never had a hard day in his freaking life. Somebody who's completely disconnected from the land, no matter how much he wants to pretend he's a cowboy, you know, he can't appreciate and, and acknowledge and recognize the land is what it is. And, and that is, as a living part of who we are, we're all connected. And I think that that, that causes a lot of these issues because there's this commodification of, of living beings. And, you know, like, like that's not like a, a be a pacifist, like don't eat meat kind of thing. Like it, it's, you know, when you are interacting with the world, interacting with living beings, be it the carrots that you're eating or, you know, beef or whatever, you have to have that reciprocity relationship with, with the life that is coming into you. So I asked the follow-up question to that last statement there. Does Jugmeet Singh know that? Knowing what you know now, because he he seems to have forgotten and it doesn't seem like he's mentioning the uh, murdered uh, children who have been found at residential schools. It doesn't seem like murdered and uh, murdered and missing Indigenous women is being uh, talked about on a daily basis or a weekly basis. Does, does Jugmeet Singh, has he become part of the quote unquote um what's the oh my god i've literally i literally had the word and then two seconds later it, it, it escaped me uh, has he has he become has he become part of sort of the the system the system that has pushed down voices of metis indigenous uh voices i mean he's a politician they all are i would have been too yeah you, know, you know i was thinking about it i was thinking about it the other day um I would have had the worst time ever being an MP because I cannot shut up for the life of me. And they, like somebody would have had to have been hired as my handler. They would have quit in the first three days because I'd have been like, you can't say this. Like, mm, I'm gonna, I'm going to say it eight times more though. And I'm going to say it louder than you, than it. like, I, I wouldn't have been able to handle it. And I think, I think it is, they all become part of the system. They become part of the, the colonialism. You know, they're, they're afraid to lose votes. They're afraid to lose the moderates. They're afraid to lose the people who, who vote liberal, but maybe might vote NDP. They don't care about the rest of them, the people who don't vote, even though there's more of them. Yeah. And, and wh why, why don't you vote? Because you have nothing to vote for. I, I, I ran on the NDP platform. It's not really, it, there's so many great things about it, but like, it, Be it wasn't nothing, anything that, to, it wasn't, it wasn't hope. It wasn't hope the way that it could have been, you know, so many people had put in amazing suggestions, like putting in, you know, completely eradicating student debt and making university free, like that would have been something, you know, or having basic income for people with disabilities. And, and then some like, that's something that was in our platform, but having that on top of so many other things like infrastructure for accessibility and, and having more focuses on actual real reconciliation and like they're like they just there could have been so much more you know and i think that that they're afraid to lose moderates so they don't go far enough they don't try hard enough and they they stick to the system too much they stick to the liberals too much it's liberal light it seems like the conservatives are liberal light and the ndp are liberal light it seems like the liberals are just cruise into whatever they want to do for the next few years and we can try to hold them account but um i i, I can completely understand where you're coming from because seeing a party that you idol not idolize i shouldn't say that but seeing a party that you I believed did, in though. you okay. know yeah and you know what though you know it's it's interesting because i feel like i feel like in politics people really try and have this like cult of personality around it um and it's hard not to get swept up in that, you know, that like that excitement that like we're a, we're a family, we're a unit. It's a, it's the same thing that like, you know, <laughs> the true anons do where it's like you just you just become entrenched in this ideology that you have to you have to be part of this. You have to just be excited with this. And you, you do get kind of like. Yeah, you just you you get really into it and it's, it's not even just believing in it, but like you, you kind of just you become part of it in a way, you know. And I think it's, I think politics are structured to try and be like that. And I also think that's why it's really unappealing to a lot of people. So where do you go from here now? You, you are 
uh, I would say, disillusioned with the uh, federal NDP. You were a party organizer in the riding of Lakeland. You were the candidate for Lakeland. Yeah. You, you, <laughs> politicians will come out and apologize and they'll say the things that they need to say to stay on or continue on or win back some potential voters. But on an issue like this, and it seems like you're very passionate about this, it seems like you're very uh, fired up about it. Could you, could you accept an apology from Jugmeet Singh if he comes out tomorrow and says, you know what, I fucked up on this one, guys. I fucked up. I should have said something sooner. I should have hold, held John Horgan's uh, feet to the flame on this one, but I didn't, and I will rectify the situation. Or do you think that he he's just going to keep on going forward because, like I said, he's buddy buddies with Premier Horgan? I don't know. I don't Honestly, I don't know what, what it would take for me to, like, be at the same point that I was I don't think I can I don't honestly know what I'm going to do I don't like I don't even know what I'm going to do tomorrow aside from work <laughs> like you know like I'm very I'm very much I kind of just go with the flow um I don't think a, an apology is enough to be honest I think that an apology apology would be a good start an acknowledgement I think what the NDP really needs to do is hire indigenous people into their PR like a lot of indigenous people. Um, they need to hire way more indigenous people in positions that they don't even think that they, they need an indigenous person in. It has to become a priority. Um, and yeah, like I, I think that that's talk to their, they need to talk to their EDAs, the people who are still there. They need to talk to people who have left. They need to talk, talk to the people who wanna leave and they need to sort themselves out because like this fucking sucks. I like, and I like people in the NDP. I'm like, I hope that they don't feel like I'm shitting on them exclusively. And if they, you know, if they're taking it personally, like build a bridge, get over it. Come on. Like we're all adults here. It's just politics. Don't take it personally. Um, but you know, like, like we all have a responsibility to, to be saying shit about this. And honestly, most of my frustration is that not enough people are, not enough people are, are saying what needs to be said. And yeah. Well, and I, I, honestly, as much as I want to keep going in politics, I don't know if I'm going to be able to, because like I said, I can't shut up for the life of me. And I know at some point I'm going to get to a point where I've said something and someone's going to be like, mm, you tweeted this and it's too much. And I'll be like, eh, OK, whatever. Yeah, I, I, I think and this is going to be me being me. I think every party has uh, skeletons in their closet that they really need to uh um look in the mirror before they start throwing people under the bus for saying something or tweeting something um i i just like yeah the liberals okay this is gonna this this is this is a whole new world but i'm gonna say this and i'm gonna let oh you yeah shit respond. on the liberals i love that let's go um the moment the liberals said blackface is okay is the moment when i went okay the, the, there's no there's no like the floor for every party has basically become this like yeah that's we, why we have parties that are freaking just straight up using nazi pair, like slogans at this point yeah at cpc uh, yeah at ppc i i just oh. I, I I'm so disillusioned with party politics. Like the last few elections, I have not. I vo I went in and voted, but I spoiled my ballot because I just couldn't vote for any of them because I I I I try to vote for the best person, and none none of them are are bringing me to their party. And I and that's that's the problem. Why aren't we like if you're going to do electoral politics? try to do better appeal to people give people something to actually give a shit about like like it's it's so frustrating because what like watching the people who make policies and in, in every party really i mean like communist party is fucking killing it their policy is great i'm gonna say that but like when you look at the major parties their policies are written by a lot of people like there's there's some that come in from amazing EDAs that are doing amazing grassroots work but there's a lot of people who put policies in there who have like no idea what it is like to be a person you know there's there's people re really every single person that I ran against in my writing 
not a single one of them had any idea what it was like to work in minimum wage because they were all business owners or had had this, that, the other. None of them had an idea on what it was like to, to do business, you know, anything that, that I would do or do labor jobs or do anything that they say they support. None of these people know how to do oil field work, right? But they're making policies about this stuff. They're, they're creating things around our lives without ever having put in, you know, any kind of thought into what our lives are like. So it's all stupid. <laughs> it's all ridiculous. And it's, it's, yeah, Th- that's, I think that's, that's a problem is that none of these parties have real people in them anymore. It's just people who have created these cults of personalities around being in politics. And it's, like it, you could do better. You can be better. And those people can be better. They just have to actually give a shit. Looking to get your message out? Looking to get your product heard about? Have an upcoming event in the province of Alberta. For as low as $50 per week, you can now advertise on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Reach out today by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca and click on advertise now if you book your advertisement during the month of december you will get 50 percent off now let's get back to the episode so i i want to pivot a little bit here i'm going to pivot and you mentioned it a little bit before in the at the beginning probably about five minutes into the interview um i i'm a strong believer of the sins of the father um, if you're if your father kills somebody, you have to bear that weight for the rest of your life, and it continues on. Um, the federal NDP, and I think you and I, I kind of both agree on this one. The, the the federal NDP fucked up on this issue. They royally spo- screwed the pooch on this one. Yeah. Do you hold that against the Alberta NDP? Because they are. I mean, they- I got my own problems with the Alberta NDP. I'm going to be honest, I have problems with every single party. I don't think, I think there's no such thing as perfection. And I don't think that any party, regardless of how good or bad they are, is like shy of criticism. And I will criticize every party over anything because I think that it's important to, and I think it's important to, to be realistic and grounded, especially after this experience. Um, I was also in, in kind of a cult once. So like this, this is where my brain's at. Right. But like, I have my own problems with each of the parties. I mean, like, I don't love that the, the Alberta NDP bought a pipeline. Oh. Oh, was that me or was that you? It, my mom was trying to call me um, <laughs> because she's really mad at me. Um, I was supposed to call her earlier today and I did not. So I'm probably in trouble. But um, then you just okay. say I was speak. I'm speaking to the media, mom. I've got things that yeah. I need to talk about. <laughs> mom, I'm being interviewed. I'm famous now. Get out exactly. Of here. I'll be heard across <laughs> Canada and Australia, Gosh. and for some strange reason, Germany. <laughs> nice, guten Tag. Um, the only other German I know is Auschwitz and the Gettysburg. Oh, and der Frau trinks Wasser because I did use Duolingo for a little bit. There you go. Yeah. Um, so you, that's, that's for your German viewer. It's my German viewers and my listeners. There you go. I just I need I need like subtitles now. That's I'll hire you to do all my subtitles in German. Perfect. <laughs> they won't oh. be good. <laughs> you, you were talking about the Alberta NDP and how they bought a yeah. pipeline. So so it, as a progressive, yeah. like literally the pipeline that they are trying to build is the pipeline the Alberta NDP bought. Isn't it like, like two and two does not equal four here. Well, it equals four, but it seems like the Alberta NDP are trying to make it equal three. So people don't remember that they bought the pipeline that literally people are getting like kicked out of their house. So you talked about the provincial uh, uh, policy that came forward or the bylaw or whatever, whatever the hell it is. Resolution. Yeah. Resolution. Thank you. Like, Guys, that was like, us. That was all gross, grassroots. We did that. We we did that um, because we wanted a show of solidarity. Actually, on the Saturday, um, another delegate uh, <laughs> during the question and answer period with Rachel Notley actually went on the mic and, and asked for Rachel to st- stand in solidarity 
with the Wet'suwet'en. Um, and it was a really awesome moment. Laura, if you're listening, I love you. I hope you're listening because I'm definitely going to send you this on my Twitter later. So you're listening. Um, yeah, that, that was a, like, that was already something that we were pushing for. That was a grassroots moment. So did she come um, out and stand in solidarity? Uh, I don't remember her exact answer, but it was along the lines of, I don't understand enough about the situation and won't comment on it right now. Okay. Which is like, Google's your friend, but okay. 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sure. You didn't um, hear about if, it. If I was an NDP handler at that moment, I would have been fired for not being prepared, not preparing your leader for any question that could potentially come up. So that's that's when one of the handlers should have been, oh, there's a tech problem. Sorry. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, no, um, instead they just prove their incompetence. So you're going to stay active in politics. You, you, you. I'm assuming you're going to stay active in politics. You're going to stay active in commenting on politics. Well, I, and there's, I'm doing things in Lloyd too. Um, I'm a part of a group called Lloydminster and Vermilion for Equity, and we're actually um, going to be having a solidarity show for well it'll have already happened when this is airing um but we'll be standing in solidarity with the wet sweat and at the rcmp building um and i'm also going to be joining them for a street team and helping out the unhoused in our community so like i'm still doing things um within my community and within like the broader lakeland and um saskatchewan area i love i i do miss lloydminster i did meet people up there a few people that i always tried to stay in contact with but um I, I remember that the ho houselessness is a major issue in that community and it's yeah. sad because uh, I remember the very first time that I moved, this is completely off, this is like completely not what we were supposed to be talking about, but <laughs> that's the great thing about my show, I can do whatever the hell I want. Yeah, and we're both Minsterites, you exactly. know, you gotta talk about the border city. My very first interview in Lloydminster with a, was with a reverend for their coldest night of the year walk. And I remember doing yeah. that. And I remember going, are you crazy? You're sending me out in minus 30 weather to do that cold walk. And then I realized when you went down and you looked, there are people who live in minus 30 weather. So my bitching and complaining needed to stop and get like a little self uh, attitude adjustment. So I, I do hope you stay and do that because I know it is a major issue. I don't know much about the Vermilion houselessness issue, but Lloyd Minster, I know it is a quite a big issue. Yeah, yeah it's, and it, you know, it's only been getting worse, yeah. um, especially with like, since the oil field had been dropping. I don't know what it's going to look like now that oil field is picking up a little bit. I don't expect it'll be for very long, to be honest with you. Um, but I remember like, right, it was right before I, um, had signed up as a candidate. And this is actually one of the reasons why I ended up ultimately thinking like, yeah, I do want to do this. Um, there's a young man who sells art in Lloyd once in a while. You'll see him around. I haven't seen him in a while, but uh, I went over and was chatting with him and I, I've made it a point whenever I see somebody, you know, out on the street, I, I, you know, go grab something, bring some mutual aid to them, whether that's money, food, whatever. I, it's just a thing that I've been doing for a while and you, you sit, you chat. And, um, he had been, he had come to Lloyd to work in the oil field and, uh, he lost his job pretty much like as soon as he got here and lost his home. And he ended up having, like, he had bought a bus that he was going to like do one of those travel things later, you know, like when you refit the bus and you, you go out and you travel, he was like planning to do that later, but he had this old school bus that he was living in and uh, couldn't get a job anywhere because every time he applied for something, he didn't have an address, couldn't, couldn't work. So he had all these tickets and all of this. He had moved here to Lloyd to get a job, didn't have it, couldn't get it. And that it, it, it's not a unfamiliar story here there's a lot of people in that same situation or similar situations. And it just, it, it, it just frustrates me so much that it doesn't seem like anybody gives a shit, at least at the, the level where they could actually do something. I, I am glad you give a shit though, because we need, we need people out there like yourself who give a shit on issues like what's happening to the, what's, 
the first nations of bc <laughs> What's um, <laughs> yeah sorry i i will get it my, my, my mind's just like my mind like it sees the letters it's just it, yeah bleh, and that's well i mean you get it, it takes time and you get there and as, as long as you you're learning and you're trying right that's exactly um the last question i'm going to ask you and it's going to be sort of an open-ended question so this is the point of time in the show where I'm going to go make a sandwich and you're going to rant as you said you were going to do. <laughs> awesome. What we we have talked for the last literally hour. What would you want the people of this who are listening right now, who are listening to this across Canada, across Turtle Island, a, around the world to know about this issue and how we can fix it? Wow, that's such a great question. Um, I, I leave the great first, question for the end. <laughs> yeah. Um, first and foremost, uh, speak up about it in any capacity that you have to do. Go and learn about the situation. There's a lot of really great resources, um, a lot of really fantastic activists. Uh, there are people on Twitter, and I can I can give you some names that you can list where people have that information, and I can send you some of that information as well to post on your site so that people can check that out. Um, so absorb as much information as you can understand what the Indian Act is and how the Indian Act plays its part in this because unless you understand the Indian Act um, history and how it applies to today's laws it, it continues to be a kind of muddy look because you don't understand the difference between the hereditary and the band chiefs um, next step as soon as you you've done that you've listened to the activists you've heard what's going on I'm um, seeing videos from Wet'suwet'en. Email your MPs, your MLAs, your representatives. If you're from another country, you know, email your representatives and say, "Hey, email this person in Canada." That kind of thing. You know, um, email John Horgan, Jug Meat, uh, email Justin Trudeau, Aaron O'Toole. Tag as many of them as you can in in an email, um, telling them to focus on on Wet'suwet'en to stop. Uh, immediately have the, the RCMP removed from the situation, have the RCMP cease and desist, stop the pipeline, and also call for the abolition of the Indian Act. Um, continue that pressure, get your friends to continue that pressure, and, and support Indigenous activists. Um, if you have the extra funds, also donate to the to the people and defect defenders. Um, they need support legally, they need support supplies-wise. Um, yeah, that's that's really, I think, what people can do aside from, you know, physically being able to to be on the ground yourself, if, if that was something that people were able to do. I don't really think it's a good idea with pandemic and just um, respect of the, the wet sweat end, but, you know, get out, learn and help in any way that you can um, and talk about it and, and never stop talking about it. And when another issue happens to another indigenous person, another indigenous group, talk about it then and, and never stop talking about these things because the second that we stop, we let genocide happen again. Um, Des, I want to, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing this because I, 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 I I'm always concerned when I don't know the person who's coming on, but I, I, I get, I got a good vibe from your social media when I looked at it and I was expecting a spirited conversation and I got that. And I appreciate people who are willing to just openly say, I want to talk about something, let's do it. And you, you, I'm assuming you did your research on me and on my show. So I'm assuming you did a little bit of, okay, this person, who is he? What, what are we going to talk about? We had that conversation. And for the last hour, I have learned that I need to do a little bit more research still. I need to do a little bit more education for myself as well. But I need to keep on having these conversations because like I said during the interview, uh, we, we have that conversation of 216 uh, children in Kamloops who were found at a residential school and unmarked graves, but that number is not 216 now. It is 7,000 some hundred, 7,500 and something at this point in time right now. And I apologize, I should know that number off the top of my head and I should know that because it's an important number, but it is a lot more. 
we need to continue talking about Indigenous issues. Yeah. We need to still talk about uh, uh, First Nations uh, rights and uh, the Indian Act. Like you are completely right on that. Uh, but so I thank you from the bottom of my heart for being able to come on this show and just have that open conversation and not be detracted by some of the stupid questions I might have asked. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? There's no such thing as a stupid question, really. Um, you haven't talked to my there's, husband, then. There's, <laughs> yeah, there's, you know, there's like ignorant questions, but there's, I think when you genuinely want to learn, you can never ask a stupid question. Um, because at the end of the day, like, we're all, we're all just a bunch of apes trying to do our best. Um, and our best starts with communicating each other with each other and learning about each other and, and just loving each other and, and doing what we can. So yeah, and thank you so much for having me on here. This was awesome. I, I like, I wanted to be on a podcast so bad. You came, it was, you're so much fun to speak to. And uh, so if you're not already subscribed, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop this. If you're not already subscribed to the podcast and you're just here coming from my Twitter, cause I'm definitely gonna be blasting this out. You better subscribe. Um, otherwise we are now nemesis. We are fighting. Me and me and non-subscriber, we are fighting. I could not agree <laughs> more. I will say this to uh, the people who usually tune into these shows and watch these shows. If you haven't, like Des said, if you haven't already hit the subscribe button, we are on uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, we're via YouTube. The uh, the videos of these show up as well. Um, head over to our Facebook page, head over to our Twitter page. We will be linking Des's Twitter feed in the show notes. So if you want to follow her, scroll down. Literally scroll down, or if you're listening to this in the uh, audio version, go back a page and literally scroll down. And then you will see her Twitter <laughs> handle where you can click and it will take you to Twitter and you can follow her. Um, she and is, I apologize for anything I say in advance. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great episode. If you want to uh, continue hearing these stories and I'm going to do the shameless plug as I always do at the end of these episodes. If you want to hear, continue hearing these great conversations that we're doing, please uh, head over to patreon.com backslash cross border interviews, hit the, uh, hit the donate button $3 a month. It does help us continue shows like this. And it helps us bring stories and interviews like the one with Des to light and it, starts a conversation with some people. So from everyone here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast, have yourself an excellent rest of your Wednesday. We will be back Thursday morning, that's tomorrow, with another great episode of the show. So tune in because it won't it will be a rock and roll artist from here in the great city of Calgary. So tune into that. It will be great. Um Des, once again, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good one, guys.